and welcome to Yorkshire Views. I'm Daisy Taplin. And I'm Ben Duke. And it's nice to have you here with us this afternoon. On today's show, we sent Julian for a stroll down to Dewsbury to see what canal life is all about. With spring now here, it seems a perfect chance to visit the Yorkshire Sculpture Museum for a nice day out. And at last, Ben went out into Huddersfield to find out why some grown men put their best fighting armour on and hit each other around the head. It looked like a lot of fun, but not sure I'd be up for doing that. The helmet might squash your hair. <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> and we'll be finishing up on a live performance from Wakefield lad Johnny the Firth. Exciting stuff. Now, I think I can speak for most people when, they say, when I say there's nothing nicer than a nostalgic walk down the beach. Fish and chips, ice cream, and if you're small enough, maybe even a ride on a donkey. We sent Jess Hall to the beach for a trip down memory lane. Welcome to Scarborough a popular holiday destination on Yorkshire's east coast. There's many things to do here like have a dip in the sea, grab some fish and chips and ride a donkey. For years, young children have been riding up and down Britain's beaches on the traditional seaside activity, the donkey. The tradition began in Victorian times, but now is less popular. It is probable that the donkeys offered to ride on were originally working draft animals in the cockle industries around the coast. For a small charge of £2, children get to have the experience of riding a donkey for around 100 yards down the beach. It certainly takes me back to my youth. The following day, I met owner of Hee Haw Donkeys in Scarborough, Marilyn, to see how she looks after her donkeys. So I'm here at the old rifle range where Marilyn looks after these donkeys. How many donkeys do you have here? We have, well at the moment we've just got eight, eight. Um, but we, we have 16 altogether. Right. But some of them are out on winter loan. People have them for winter sometimes Yeah. in pairs. And uh, how often do you come down here and look after them? Every day. We Every come day? Down. Yeah. Oh yeah. And yeah. what do they eat, like carrots? Uh, yeah, they have um, on the, the grass, they have hay all the time in the hay ring on here. Uh, they eat carrots, apples and um, and horse food, oats yeah. and bran and stuff like that. Molly and uh, which is your favourite donkey? Oh, I don't have a favourite. You don't have a favourite? It's like having a favourite child, so I love them all. <laughs> you love them all. And uh, what's this one named then? This is Patch. Patch. It's called Patch because he's got a little white patch on his back. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And what's that one? Uh, this is Rupert, who is very affectionate, like Rupert. That's the little bottom scratch there, aren't you, Rupert? Are these the two that like the most attention then? Uh, yes, yeah. <laughs> Fuss pots. Yeah. The other two are on the lot are out in the field munching. That's all I think about is food, really. Stomachs. And um, how often do you take them down to the beach? Uh, well, we go, at the moment, it's just weekends and holidays. And are they quite popular? Do a lot yeah, of people want very to? popular. Yeah. yeah, it's still, you know, they've been going for hundreds of years on the beach and then kids still love them. They're just, you know, a lot of them had never even seen donkeys before. Wonky donkey, honky donkey, wiggy wonky donkey. So uh, what do you do to uh, groom the donkeys then? Oh, well, it's quite hard work at this time of year because obviously they, they like to go and roll in the field so they're usually covered in mud. So um, we give them a quick brush over, um, starting at the, the head and the neck and gradually you work your way down through the legs. It take a lot of doing and you, you do one side all the way down. You always brush the way the hairs go that way. Try and get a bit of the mud out. Then you go to the back end and you do the back leg this side. Obviously I'm not doing it all because it'll take me ages. And then you start around at the other side again. Do the other side. They like being groomed. They love it. They all stand to be groomed nicely. Don't you? Hey? Can I have a go? Yeah. Probably get a bit dirty. 
Yeah, the feet, the feet need picking out, so each, they should be done quite regularly really, so it's a matter of going down the leg. Hold up, hold up, coming up. Good boy. And then you, you pick it out from the front there. All right, good boy. Good boy, we're finished. Good boy. That's it. And down you go. Good boy. Good boy. And uh, what about the teeth as well? The teeth, we have to get a dentist and put the teeth. Uh, should, how be, often do they have that? should be every couple of years really, every, couple every two years. years to get the dentist to check the teeth. Uh, sometimes they need filing and the dentist will put a big sort of cage thing around the mouth uh, and in the mouth so that the mouth is open obviously and then they can sort them out. Domino's quite young, he's only seven, uh, so quite nice. And I saw a donkey. After a long day of being groomed and playing with his friends, this is where Domino rests. Next time I'm in Scarborough, I'll be sure to save this little fella a polo. Well, it's been a long time since I've been small as riding a donkey. I don't know about you. I know, I'm so nostalgic now. They're so lovely. I know, bless them. <laughs> Now, donkeys aren't the only old-fashioned and slightly odd form of transport Yorkshire has to offer. Yorkshire has a history of canal boating and now a growing number of people are choosing life in the slow lane. Our very own Julian Serma put on his sea legs and took to the water to find out more. <laughs> you wake and know. The boat is still as bones and you, its red heart beating. The canal was taken in its sleep and paved with cold. The chilled air gathers round your feet. The ice, disgruntled, shifts itself and chews a little on the hull, sets itself to set again. Beneath the glazed fish flicker like grey flames, silent, watchful. Inside, you go on with the business of making tea, waiting for crocuses. Hi there, today I'm here in Dewsbury. Now, there's no worry of being stuck in ice, thanks to the mild winter we've just had. That was frozen in by Joe Bell. Today, I'm going to meet David Harrison and his boat, Dreamer, to find out more about his life down the canal. Hi, David Harrison. Oh. Meet you, I'm Julian. Pleased to meet you. This is a fantastic looking boat you've got here. Oh, thank you, we like it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Um, it looks very cosy inside, do you mind if you have a look? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, This is incredibly cosy. Very yeah, cosy. Lovely, yeah. It's nice and cosy on an evening. By the 1970s, a majority of waterways had gone out of use and fallen into disrepair. But thanks to a group of enthusiasts restoring them, they're now open for leisure use for tourists and residents alike. So David, thank you very much for letting us into your canal boat. Very nice of you. So David, why, what made you change from being on the solid ground to the waterways? Well, it's always been a dream, a, a dream of ours anyway, but we, I mean, we have chartered dirt boats in the past, you know, Loch Ness and places like that, and Norfolk Broads, and and uh, so, you know, this was a dream of ours, and uh, that then it became a reality, you know, once the kids fled the roost, and mm. uh, we had a bit of uh, ready cash. Nice. So. so, when did you decide that you wanted to live in a canal boat? Well, we were talking about it five or six years ago, and then uh, and then obviously it, it did become a. Uh, you know, not a dream, a reality. So, so then uh, we sold the house, and uh, and here we are today. It must have been quite a big jump from moving to a house to a canal boat. Or were you well prepared? Or you know, have you read up on all your books? 
I mean, I'm pretty easy anyway, but I mean, it, it was probably a big jump for Alison, my mm. wife, uh, but but she has got used to it and uh, and we're starting to like it and she's going to retire soon, so we'll be able to just have it easy along the canal at four mile an hour. Where's the furthest place you've been to? Well, we haven't, we haven't really we haven't really done any yet. You know, we're waiting for a, a holiday coming up now and, uh -huh. and just give it a spin, you know, really. You know, we haven't really done anything apart from getting it to where we are now. Canal boats first came to use for transportation in the Middle Ages, but have been used largely since the start of the Industrial Revolution in the 18th century. Back then, they were used solely for the transportation of goods, so the chances of taking a scenic holiday up the Great British Canal system probably wasn't an option. David, I have a burning question which I wish to ask. Do you think we could take Dreamer for a ride? I'd 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 a bit I'd like to have said yes, but uh, because of the floodgates uh, and and you know what the weather's been like, uh, it might be difficult just right now. But uh, another time maybe. Okay, next time. Mm -hmm. <sighs> David, thank you very much for letting me inside your boat. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your yeah, time. Yeah. It's not hard to see why a lot of people choose this lifestyle. I could quite easily get used to the sound of the river birds in the morning and the breeze on my face as I captain my own boat down the scenic waterways. That was really interesting. I really enjoyed that. I don't realise that canal boats could be that interesting, to be fair. <laughs> I might have to buy one. <laughs> well, look who we have in the studio. Hi, Julian. Hello. How are you doing? Very well, thank you. Good. Um, so you didn't get to actually drive the, the canal boat in the, on the day? Unfortunately not. Under certain circumstances, we just couldn't go. But hey, hey, maybe next time. <laughs> so, uh, what do you think are the advantages of uh, the canal boat lifestyle? Mm. Well, personally, I would say that um, it's very, you have your own uh, private area. You know, you can do what you like, when you like. Mm. Uh, you have no one coming up to your front door asking you perhaps to buy this, or maybe uh, would you like to purchase this, or have a, you know, whatever, you know. So, it's, it's very uh, much your own space, and I quite like that. So do you reckon that you'd look into living on a canal boat in the future? Well, it's definitely an intriguing possibility, yeah, um, sure, yeah, one day I may look into it. <laughs> well, I could see myself having a uh, canal boat maybe one day. I would love that, I think, yeah, that's definitely my kind of thing. And we could do a show from a boat. Like the modern day Rosie and Do you think it'd be possible <laughs> to do a show from a canal boat? Why not? Totally. <laughs> might as well it. try it, haven't yep. you? Might as well try it. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much for coming in, Julian. Thank you, guys. Thank you. We'll see you later. So, from boats to art, the area has a long list of famous artists and sculptors are just one of a kind that displays in our region. Jess went to Wakefield to have a look around the Yorkshire Sculpture Park. Wakefield, a city located in West Yorkshire by the River Calder on the eastern edge of the Pennines. I've come here to see what attractions there is to do, whatever the weather. One place that is popular for a nice day is the Yorkshire Sculpture Park. It's a great way to combine culture, exercise and fresh air for all the family. The Sculpture Park is set in the 500 acre Breton estate and opened in 1977. The history of the estate reaches back to Norman times and the park are committed to protecting and developing this historic pleasure ground whilst making it accessible to the visitors. They continue to work with artists to create opportunities for people to engage with sculpture in a meaningful way and provide educational programmes for young people to learn creatively. There are around 70 sculptures and the park still continues to expand, including their new exhibition by Ursula von Ridingsvard. Not only are the sculptures a good thing to see, they're also good to get up close and personal with, so you can actually feel what the artists have made them out of. This particular sculpture is called Dream City by Anthony Caro. It's used different shapes and sizes to relate to the rooftops of New York buildings. One new sculpture at the park is The Network by Tom Price. This sculpture came to the park in 2013 and has become a hit with the public. There are many interesting sculptures that people especially come to see, whether it's because of the unusual material or shape. Sophie Ryder is the artist of this sculpture. She's renowned for her animal imagery, as you can tell in the sculpture behind me. Sitting is a monumental wire work which both overlooks and frames the surroundings. 
Anthony Gormley is renowned for his distinctive representations of the human form, made from cast iron. He is well known for his creation, The Angel of the North. I went to see his sculpture, One and Other, which is by the Cascade Bridge. I've been trying to find a sculpture from one of the most famous artists who people come to see, Anthony Gormley, and I couldn't find it until I looked on top of a tree. There are many different types of sculptures ranging from old to new, such as the electronic galloping horse which is created by Julian Oakley. Park has worked from various artists such as Molecule Man by Jonathan Borowski, Buddha by Nicky de Saint Fal, Marys and the Running Dogs by Safi Ryder, Lady's Bonnet by Ursula von Weidingsbard, and the famous seated figures by Magdalena Abikanovic. But when the weather isn't going your way, there's always an alternative. For those of you who want more of a thrill, why not try out F1 Go Karting? F1 indoor karting proves very popular amongst the public. The indoor activity has been successful due to focusing on providing a fast, exciting but safe karting experience. So I'm here with Nikki, he's one of the staff at here at F1 Go Karting. So how long have you been running for? Uh, F1 Karting has been here since 1999. Right, and what are the different sessions that you run? Um, it varies really if you got adults, um, we do race type events. If it's juniors, it's mainly arrive and drive. And is it quite cheap or quite um, Depends where you come through. Through the week we have deals, three for the price of two, ten while five. After 5pm it's £5 off a person. Right. Um, juniors it's £20 for half an hour. Thirty pounds for an hour. Adults maximum is forty-five, and that's like an hour's driving. All oh, right. And what days are you open? We're open seven days a week, ten one ten. And when is the busiest? Mainly weekends, Saturdays, Friday nights, Saturdays. Mainly. Right. Let's go and have a look. F1 was one of the first in the UK to have tarmac surfaces indoors. It has a range of sessions to suit everyone's needs, including private practices and even mini or full grand prix. So how long is the track? The uh, track's about 550, 600 metres long. And how actually fast are the carts? Uh, the adult carts go around 40 miles an hour and the junior's 20 to 25. Alright, so is this just the normal procedure people get kitted up? Yeah, yeah, but, uh, because they get kitted up, sometimes they want to save the DVD, we take them down to the circuit, explain the main parts of the circuit, flag runs, and then uh, off we go. With their state-of-the-art timing system, 80 metre long speedy straight and hair raising bends, nothing else brings you closer to the F1 experience. Oh, the Yorkshire Sculpture Park is such a beautiful place to walk around. I should admit, go-karting does seem more like my kind of thing, but I might have to give it a try one day. Yeah, definitely. Try not to crash. I'll try. <laughs> now, there's a lot to be said about the history of Yorkshire from the Roman invasion to the Vikings. So, what about the people battling to keep the history alive? To some of you, it might all seem like a fantasy, but for the groups of battle reactant fanatics, this is a very serious and sometimes very painful business. I went into Huddersfield to see what all the fuss was about. Clarence Household's weekly training session ahead of a busy summer period of shows across the UK. The Clarence Household is a reenactment group who specialise in displaying social and military aspects of medieval history, more specifically the era known as the War of the Roses. That's between 1460 and 1485. These people here show so much commitment training all year round in rain and shine to make the summer months and the events they put on which is breathtaking for all that come to see. They are based around the Huddersfield and Bradford area and they have members from far and wide all over the country. It takes a lot of time and dedication to prepare for these events and leader of the group Jack Edwards believes it's a hobby worth giving up time for. Well, we're a reenactment group um, called the Clarence Household which is based around the George Duke of Clarence who's uh, brother of Richard III. Um, the group's been running for about 25 years now um, and we try to recreate aspects um, from the 15th century from the Wars of the Roses period. 
Um, we are one of the very few groups around that I know of that meet every week. Um, we're here, rain or shine, uh, we've trained in the snow, we've trained in the boiling heat. Um, it comes from all of our members having such a passion for it really. Um, it's, it's a great way to sort of actually get a community spirit within the, within the group um, and it draws a lot of people together. So the more people who, who collect at one place at one time, it's easy to keep the momentum going that way. There's a huge amount of um, different aspects that I really enjoy. Obviously the military um, and, the, and the combat side, um, but the research, the recreation of the artefacts from the period, um, the communication of the knowledge with the public, um, as well as just simply getting out to, to different castles and battle sites and seeing things that not everybody else gets to do. Um, sleeping in uh, castles um, and seeing the sort of the moon rise over them at three in the morning or so is something that not everybody else gets to uh, have the opportunity to experience. Although some of the combat moves that they use do look slightly violent, they do have to adhere to some safety regulations. And as you can see behind me, this is an example of some of the combat moves that they perform. Female members are sparse, particularly in the fighting scenes, but we still managed to catch one who was interested in the combat. Hard question. I enjoyed most aspects of it. Uh, I enjoyed the social side of it and getting to meet people. I enjoy the fighting, because it's nice and active. But I also enjoy the cooking and, you know, just the atmosphere around the camp when we're at events. It's just really cool. I think the audience take away that, you know, there's a lot more to history than you'd probably think and a lot of the stuff that you learn isn't right and you know you just get to learn so much stuff that you'd never think of and I think they just enjoy taking it all in. When reenacting the battle scenes many injuries can occur as they intend to make contact but not to seriously injure. Although the weapons they use are blunted the force of them can still cause serious harm so this requires a lot of training for the more advanced fighting scenes. The costumes are one of the most important aspects of what we're going to show. If they are authentic, the show will be too. It adds to the whole magic of it. Now these are called turn shoes. Uh, these are made out of leather, uh, stitched inside out effectively and then turned the right way around. This protects the stitching from wear and tear. Um, although the leather is waterproof to an extent, they still let in water if you're sort of walking around in a particularly wet environment. So above those, he wears these which are called patterns. Uh, the idea of these is they are effectively overshoes. Um, raise your foot an inch or so out of uh, mud, out of wet, so it keeps your feet nice and dry. I think it's probably about time that I uh, try something on, if that's alright with you. Okay, so if you lose that uh, the vape there, we'll see if we can get <laughs> some proper stuff. Fantastic. Well, thank you for that. How do, how do I look? Very good, very good. Well, let's go. Well, I hope you've enjoyed our little adventure. I know that I have. Now, back to the 21st century. So, Jack and I'll be uh, setting any trends then with uh, that style? Yeah, definitely. I think you should dress like that all the time. <laughs> I think I should too, actually. I'll tell you what, they were getting perilously close to my legs with those uh, sticks as well. They really were. Dangerous. I was getting very nervous. <laughs> well, it looks like that's all we have time for today. Up now, and to play us out, we've got Johnny the Firth performing a song from his new album, Broken Bones. Here he is with Just The Way I'm Feeling, and thanks so much for watching. Join us again next week for more views on Yorkshire. Have a great weekend. Goodbye for now.
Just the way I'm feeling, baby. 